uh, uh, the role of the OSCE in addressing the war in Ukraine and its uh, consequences. We have circulated, uh, uh, together with the invitation, uh, the highlights uh, of, uh, from the other meeting with a number of suggestions for follow-up. So we we'll keep those in mind as we relook at the state of affairs. Unfortunately, the situation has not improved since the last meeting. So uh, we need to stay focused and we need also to see what uh, we can do to update uh, uh, our assessment of the situation, but also to look at operationally how can uh, OSC parliamentarians and the parliamentary assembly as such uh, continue to contribute. So we will open this meeting with uh, uh, a presentation introduction by the President, uh, President Sederfeld. Uh, Margareta, you have the floor. Good afternoon. Thank you, Ambassador Sanier. Uh, dear fellow parliamentarians, dear Secretary General, dear ladies and gentlemen, dear former presidents, thank you for joining today's webinar addressing the war in Ukraine. Because of this serious situation and the high number of people who have been victims of the war, I suggest that we start with a silent minute in honor of them. Thank you. Thank you very much. And and then I would like to thank Ambassador Sanier and his team for the work you are doing and uh, to hosting the, and arranging today's event and uh, supporting peace in Ukraine and of course the work we can do as parliamentarians. I would also like to thank uh, Secretary General Roberto Montella and the Secretariat for the work you are doing to support all the delegates of OECPA in, uh, I say, our important work to support uh, peace and stability in Ukraine. Thank you for this. And uh, if it looks strange, and if uh, my, the sound is uh, strange, it's also because I'm sitting at the airport and making my short introduction. And it's almost precise one month since the last webinar on the Russian's war in Ukraine. And I see it's very important that we, as members of OSCE Parliamentary Assembly, keep updated on the development of the war and exchange views and best practice on activities to contribute to, uh, to our mandate as parliamentarians. And of course, with respect of Ukraine's territorial and integrity, the humanitarian situation and the situation for refugees. And I hope you will find this opportunity to discuss the war in Ukraine valuable for your political engagement in the different arenas where I take part, and also for not less least the important work in your national parliaments. Uh, we as MPs and members of OSCE, we can contribute and we can do a lot to promote peace, not least by pushing our governments in front of us, but also to talk and discuss with our constituencies and use our parliamentarian positions in different ways. The war in Ukraine, it has gone on today for 77 days. It's a long time. It's a long time of suffering for people. 
And therefore, it's important that we can do everything in our mandate. And I would like to thank, already in the beginning here, Mr. Abad, Ambassador Biladsen, and Mr. Hand, and our and the del head of the Ukrainian delegation, Mikita, for their contribution today. And after we have heard from our speakers today, dear colleagues, there will be, of course, uh, an opportunity, and I think this is very important to, for us to exchange views, to give uh, remarks, and of course, right, ask questions. I would also like to mention that today's you, just as I, we hear a lot of comments that the European security order is out of use or that the, the OSCE have no mandate any longer. I would say this is totally wrong. There is a huge awareness for us and we have a duties to fulfill. 1975, when OSCE was founded, it was the cure Cold War. There was a huge... Uh, need for dialogue. And there is a huge need for dialogue today. And we have to be ready and use this opportunity and this mandate, because if there is any possibility to make and contribute to peace by the dialogue, we should use it. And before ending, I would like to say a few words about the work inside our CEPA, because I think it's also very important to be updated what happened inside our CEPA. First of all, I would like to thank you all, dear colleagues, for the work you do in different arenas. I know that there is a lot of activities going on uh, from the phone calls and the emails I receive and different meetings. This is important. Your work is important. But I would also like to mention uh, the winter meeting, the 24th of February, when the war started. We changed the agenda immediately, and it was uh, to a discussion on the war and request for Russia to end it when it started. Uh, what also have happened is that uh, I have requested the Secretariat to draft a plan for action inside our CPA, what we can do. Thank you so much for this plan, and I would also like to say thank you to the Standing Committee who have adapted it. Uh, I have requested the uh, secretari Secretariat to redraft and update the plan because the war has gone on for quite a long time. It's a need to uh, be updated also in our plan and activities. Uh, there have also been a, a visit to Poland, thanks to the invitation of the head of the Polish delegation. Uh, thank you, Barbara Batos. Uh, and it was a delegation from our CPA who visited Poland and uh, uh, showed the work to see and the work with the refugees arriving. Uh, I have also traveled to, to Moldova and would like to say thank you to the OSC mission in Moldova for their work. I traveled together with the, the OSC special representative on countering human trafficking, Mr. Val Ritchie, who is eager to work together with parliamentarians. He have also done a handbook for parliamentarians to counter uh, human trafficking. I hope you can find that handbook very useful. I met with the OSCE delegation, the speaker, and the other, of course, the OSCE mission as well. I have been to Kyrgyzstan together with UNDP, and uh, observe, uh, they had discussion on how the war and the sanctions affect them. But I think that's a lot of work done by UN, different UN interlocutors. That's important for us also to be aware of their work. I have traveled to U.S. together with a delegation with uh, Vice President Irene Chambalides and Vice President Pascal Alessard. And we met with the Health Thank you, Commission and with several different UN ambassadors. And I did also, of course, talk about the UN ambassadors about the need to stay united. Uh, and thanks to the U.S. delegation who hosted uh, our visit in uh, Washington. It was very interesting also with webinar about uh, media freedom and political opponents in 
Russia. Uh, Today, I have visited the Holy See. I met with the Deputy State Secretary and was updated about uh, uh, the whole Holy See, the State of the Vatican's uh, work on humanitarian aid and uh, uh, cooperation with uh, other churches to promote peace. And uh, there is a plan to visit Ukraine together with the delegation. I will not say so much about this because I don't want to discuss it until it's over uh, of security reasons. I hope you agree on this. Uh, I have also today appointed a special representative uh, on parliamentary diplomacy for the Russian war in Ukraine. It's Vice President Reinhold Lopatka. I think it's important that we are ready uh, to use all tools we can, including the uh, parliamentary diplomacy. Uh, this is the most important steps that have been taken, but I would mention that all the work done by you, dear colleagues, that's the most important ones. The stronger we are, and the stronger we are together, the better impact will it be. And I hope you will find today's meeting interesting. I look forward. And by this, I will give the floor back to Ambassador Sanjir. Thank you very much for listening. Uh, thank you, thank you, Madam President, for those introductory words and also for setting out the uh, various aspects of the activities of the Parliamentary Assembly following our last meeting. Now to the Secretary General, um, uh, Secretary General Montella, Roberto, you have the floor. Thank you, Ambassador Zanieri and Lamberto, and thank you to all the participants. And, um, as you all know, we are here in the context of the LCT Plus 50 initiative, which is uh, an initiative to relaunch and strengthen the OSC. And uh, I would argue that this is a very much uh, timely uh, exercise, because uh, if uh, anything uh, was proven by this war is that we need more OSC, not less of it. But um, let me also join uh, the president in thanking uh, the UN uh, crisis coordinator, uh, uh, Mr. Amin Awad. Thank you very much uh, for uh, addressing us today and also for visiting our office twice in Vienna and for working very closely with us. And also uh, my uh, dear colleague and friend, uh, Ambassador Vilatsen from the OSC um, project coordinator in the Ukraine. And warm, warm regards to Mikita Potrayev. I look forward to hearing from you, Mikita. Um, this is the second call of action, two months after the last one we had on the 23rd of March, and uh, unfortunately there is little change from the last meeting we had. Uh, it's only getting worse. Uh, since the last time we met, uh, the uh, special mission in Ukraine was closed, and that's uh, very regrettable, so 1,350 thousand OSC monitors had to leave and now the mission is closed so we don't have eyes and ears of the OSC on the ground anymore uh, and uh, you know what impact it has also in the uh, issue of information and disinformation. Um, one maybe uh, one mission maybe it's on its way to being closing I don't want to be a negative prophet here but Ambassador Vilatsen will tell us more um, and uh, what else there is more death uh, more destruction more suffering and for what I mean, this is really um, outrageous what we are seeing. Uh, from all the discussion I've had with many of you, and uh, we often speak with members of parliament, uh, I get a sense from all of you, a sense of frustration, a sense of irritation, outrage for what we see. But uh, where does it leave us? I mean, what does it leave us as OSC Parliamentary Assembly? And everybody says, you know, what can we do? Uh, the president uh, says we need to be more active. <laughs> Um, so, um, I think we have been uh, adopting a very realistic uh, uh, and sensible approach at the OSC Parliamentary Assembly. We looked at what are our tools, what are our capabilities. Uh, I thought uh, the one thing we did very well was uh, speaking up and being clear on our messages. We've had uh, very strong press releases, very strong messages also uh, issued together with the OSC Chairman in Office and the OSC Secretary General. And I think we've been very clear on these messages. I say this very often uh, and I repeat it here. I, mean, I think we've been very clear on our messaging, not only now, but we've been clear from 2014, uh, ever since uh, the annexation of Crimea, we came up with a very strong language, calling it a clear, gross, uncorrected violation of the LCT Final Act, which is, by the way, what we do here. We try to strengthen the LCT Final Act. And we said which was the country uh, that was doing this clear cross 
uh, uncorrected violation of the Helsinki final act by the Russian Federation. So we've been very clear with our message. Uh, we uh, have not sure recorded our message and of this I'm very proud. Um, we have been also doing some activities on the field. Indeed, we visited, thanks to the kind of hospitality of Barbara Bartusz and the Polish delegation, they visited the border. We saw also uh, how Poland is reacting uh, to uh, the crisis and also uh, how the victims are reacting to this. And uh, um, the president mentioned other possible activities. I will, of course, go into the details of those other activities because normally they are announced after they have been conducted, not beforehand, um, for obvious reasons. Um, we've had meetings of the Bureau of the Standing Committee of the Parliamentary Assembly, meetings like this. And uh, we are addressing soon uh, the issue of supplementary items. I'm sure that there will be a lot in our three resolutions for the three committees and the supplementary items that will be discussed, amended and voted in, uh, in Birmingham at the annual session. And so this will be really the moment when all the assembly will get together finally for the first time in, in person after um, the pandemic. And there we will have an opportunity to also have a moment of reflection on uh, where it leaves us as parliamentary assembly. Um, we have tried to contribute to dialogue. Uh, I've mentioned in the past the tentative, the offer by Vice President Guliev to host uh, both delegations in Baku. Uh, there was a little appetite for that uh, from uh, both sides, I must say. But uh, now uh, the President mentioned uh, today, and it will be announced very soon, um, Vice President uh, Reynold Lopatka has been appointed as a special representative for uh, parliamentary dialogue on Ukraine. And, uh, so we look forward through this tool of uh, Vice President Lopatka also to revive uh, the uh, tentative of dialogues that we can have with the, both parliamentary uh, delegations. I'm glad, uh, Madam President, you've taken this decision because we are in a phase where the debate is more um, leaving us on uh, the type of weapons that we should deliver and how uh, uh, lethal these weapons should be, uh, but there is uh, not so much debate on uh, besides uh, uh, the uh, um, posture that we should have in order to support our Ukrainian brothers in the battle, which is our battle, by the way, the battle for freedoms and for the values we were living. So while that part is absolutely uh, uh, commendable, and I would not enter into the details of what type of weapons we should deliver, I think it's important from our side that, that we focus on dialogue and uh, your decision today to appoint uh, one of your vice presidents to take the lead on uh, a possible uh, um, seed of dialogue. That's uh, something that uh, I appreciate and goes in line with the, let's say, a key of this parliamentary assembly, which is indeed a forum for parliamentary dialogue between parliamentarians. So I uh, commend all of us who are in this uh, meeting and I look forward to listening to the guest speakers, to listen from Nikita Puturayev and, and also to get a sense of what's the situation and then of course uh, to the debate. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Secretary General. Uh, now, um, in the recommendations uh, uh, that were uh, that emerged from the last meeting uh, that we had uh, roughly a month ago, uh, one, one of the one of the recommendations should, uh, was that the OSC should coordinate uh, as much as possible with the uh, other uh, organizations and agencies uh, uh, engaging on the ground in Ukraine. And of course, the first of those is the is the UN. So I'm very glad to welcome for this uh, keynote presentation uh, uh, Mr. Amin Awad, who is the UN Crisis Coordinator for Ukraine. He's been involved both on the political process and, of course. Uh, very much on the ground. We had uh, a meeting uh, at the beginning of the week with, uh, with him here in Vienna. I was grateful that he found the time uh, for that meeting, but in, I'm even more grateful that he found the time to talk to our parliamentarians while traveling in the region and that certainly having a very, a very charged agenda. So, uh, Mr. Awad, uh, thank you very much for uh, joining us. Uh, uh, and I'm sure everybody will be very interested in what, uh, what you have to, uh, to tell us. So, you have the floor. Sir. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Ambassador uh, Zener, uh, President uh, Sutherfield, and Secretary General Montella. Uh, happy to be here and uh, to meet with you and confer with you and hopefully to find a way forward to really um, helping and pushing some of the agenda forward. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, excellencies, uh, pleasure. 
uh, to be with you. I especially thank the OSCE Parliamentary Assembly for the strong support and partnership that I have found in them and to the United Nations in general in Ukraine. I'm also grateful for the opportunity to discuss opportunities, perspective, and uh, joint plans, if any. In the last few weeks, uh, days I was in Vienna and also uh, in, in late March, uh, where I met uh, with many of the ambassadors accredited to the OSCE, and we had a very fruitful discussion. Let me start by giving you some context where uh, we operate. Uh, the humanitarian situation in Ukraine, as also noted by some of you, continue to, de to deteriorate. And uh, when the Secretary General of the United Nations, Mr. Antonio Guterres, visited us here in Kiev uh, two weeks ago, he described Ukraine as an epic center of unbearable health ache and pain. And this is really to, to just summarize the whole situation an epic center of unbearable heartache and pain. This is how he described it in one sentence. There was a cause, of course, uh, the fastest displacement perhaps in history, uh, 14 million people. We have about 5.9 now already million outside and another 8 million inside. That's almost 14 million people. Uh, there are another 16 million people who are in need of assistance of some kind. Those who did not leave their homes were not displaced, they did not go abroad nor they were internally displaced, but they lost job, jobs, access to services, uh, access to, to relatives, uh, and, uh, and their purchasing power also reduced because of, of, of no income. And uh, also the shortage of supplies and other goods in the market. Now here at the UN, we are, uh, we are more than, uh, two, at the UN and more than 200 other uh, humanitarian organizations. Many are local, we depend on them a lot. We have managed to scale up our 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 our, uh, our delivery with speed, and we deploy additional staff across the country. Uh, I can say that now we are servicing about almost five million uh, people uh, that we have reached. We also uh, have uh, been operating in 24 oblast. We're operating out of nine humanitarian hubs, but we are in 31 locations where we have our warehouses, relay station and staff position to, to, to deliver. Uh, we have also, uh, as, a, as a result of Secretary General visit, uh, he obtained concession from the Russian side in his meeting with Putin and the Minister of Foreign Affairs for access to Mar Mariupol. Finally, 600 people were extracted from that place. It was really a horrible, and harsh situation for many of the civilians were there. Uh, but we were also able to, uh, the Secretary General was able also to set up what he calls a humanitarian contact group that will be between the Ukrainian, the Russians and the UN. And, and that could facilitate many of the humanitarian issues that we are facing and other organizations are facing. Now, there are three areas in particular where initiative and support are needed. And perhaps the OC also, was, it is an institution uh, can be of help. One, we must do more to meet the humanitarian needs of the people. We fear that by the end of the year, 25 million people will need support. The UN here, we are obliged to plan for a scenario. That scenario for up to 25 million. I just hope that that scenario does not materialize and the war does not take us to that level where 25 million people will be in need of support. But contingencies are contingencies. This is our job and we have to be prepared. We must also a scale up, uh, and the scale up so far has been been fast, but yet is bound to come to a grinding halt with growing fuel shortages, uh, damage to transport infrastructure, impacting on access to supply chains. That is that's one of the of the issues now that are facing the nations and international organization. We also must exercise foresight uh, with winter coming, where only as we just enjoy the spring around the continent. Winter will be around the corner. And for that, as our experience in the former Soviet Union, the former Yugoslavia and other places where we had crisis, we have to prepare for that in advance because mobilizing support and services and goods and material for winter can take time. So with the foresight, I would like to warn that uh, the war also impacted gas, uh, energy centers, uh, pipelines, infrastructure, and thousands will be imperiled by harsh winter conditions. That is, that is one, uh, one important. Uh, here, I will ask 
for you to support and explore options for fuel and gas supply, as well as alternative energy sources uh, for humanitarian purposes as early as possible and early investment in the rehabilitation of affected uh, civilian infrastructure also uh, should be in order. Second, uh, we must collectively focus on accelerating export and restoring Ukraine's trade. And here we have specific uh, areas uh, that you're all aware of. Uh, Ukraine has been the breadbasket of the youth of Europe and, and, and far beyond. And as one of the main producers of and exporters of various grains and fertilizers and other important commodities, the war and especially the blockade of the ports and the maritime routes in the Black Sea has created a major uncertainties regarding the production and export of these products. This is, of, of course, of, of dire consequences uh, around the world. Uh, this caused a risk of global food and commodity security. Globally, 1.7 billion people are at risk of food insecurity, poverty, and destitution. And the stability in many countries and the region is put in peril. Meanwhile, the Ukraine economy, as projected, is contracting this year by about 45%. That means this leaves also a lot of countries in the Sahel and other places in Africa and Asia, especially for agile states and certain transition uh, in a position where they'll be facing famine and hunger as early as the fall. So the situation need uh, a solution from us, a practical solution and to operationalize these solutions. First, the immediate is the capacity of alternative trading routes via roads and railway we think must increase. This will offer much needed respite to the local, to the blockade trade in the, in the Black Sea. One route is via uh, Poland to the Baltics and from there through the Baltic uh, Sea. The other road is through Romania to the Black Sea away from the, 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 the shores of, of Ukraine. And the third, of course, is to work on a plan that will bring the side together to really open uh, the trade route from the Ukrainian uh, uh, ports straight to the, uh, to the rest of the world. This is about 100, 100 ship, I was told, by the Ukrainian government a month that were lifting and shipping, their, transporting their wheat and their grains outside the country. This is a huge undertaking. This country produces 80 million tons of, of grain every year. This year, the silos are still full. But however, they just saw the seeds in the land and the harvest should be as early as July, August, but there are no silos to really store the food. The, the fear is that the food also gets rotten on the ground before it is transported out or stored elsewhere. This is going to be a disaster of magnitude if the harvest of last year and the harvest of this year will not find its way out to the rest of the world. Um, so that is one ask and I think, um, uh, the other thing is um, uh, with nearly 6 million refugees and 8 million internally displaced, durable solutions, rehabilitation, reconstruction for those who would return should really start from now. What I call putting the last first. These are activities that in any conflict we put in post-conflict, but here in the heart of Europe, they have to be put on the top of the agenda because we have up to a million people who are returning. Those are refugees and internally displaced. And I would say this was caution until we ascertain the numbers. And for that, we have to rehabilitate their home. We have to rehabilitate the social infrastructure, services, employment, and so on uh, as they come back. So uh, now we know that of those internally displaced, over one quarter plan to return. Also in the next two weeks, we can see a big movement back to many towns. Durable solution means putting the displaced people at the center of our work. And I must emphasize that they would decide when to come home and our role is to be there when they're ready to move, when they make that signal. Therefore, it is really a movement back home in dignity, freedom, uh, away from any influence. And that is the principle of our work. Also in practical term, this require close examination of the administrative and legal barriers, which previously impeded durable solutions as we've seen in many other countries. It also means early investment in the rehabilitation of housing and other essential civil infrastructure, notably water and electricity. Winter is around the corner. 
to allow normal life to resume. And it requires also to firmly uh, incorporate durable solutions in the recently announced national recovery plan so as to leave no one behind and to link all of these rehabilitation, repair, and, and durable solutions, which is a light uh, kind of formula with the bigger reconstruction rehabilitation activities and link from now the IFIs with this work and this plan from early, from early on and have a standing mechanism, standing mechanism to put the donors together, the IFIs, the humanitarian development uh, united uh, on a standing mechanism to really be able to, to react, not to have donors briefings and donors conferences. And then with the end of each conference and each meeting, it becomes an end in itself. It really, we need understanding, uh, of understanding mechanism that can, can be a watchdog and really uh, alert the world to what's happening here and how best the world can come together. And especially in Europe and the OCE and its member states is also well placed to, to, to play that role and, 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 and do uh, a global good uh, for everyone. Excellencies, I think the impact of the war in Ukraine across the region and the world is profound and far reaching. I think we will continue to do our work as far as scaling up, uh, preparing those who want to retain relentlessly and seek humanitarian access to reach people wherever they are. And we know that uh, what is needed now most is an end to the conflict. And the second UN Secretary General has offered in many occasions during his visit here, visit to Russia, Ukraine, and Turkey. He said, I'm a broker of peace, and that offer stands. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Awad, for your presentation. Thank you also for keeping it so operational. I think it's important that you help our parliamentarians also be better aware of what are the key challenges. I think it's very important that you pointed to three broad areas where the engagement of the parliamentary assembly and of individual parliamentarians can make a difference. So I would like to join your appeal uh, for, for everybody to engage, to involve it, to think how they can contribute to addressing uh, these uh, um, uh, uh, very challenging uh, sets of issues that you that you have raised with us. So thank you, thank you also for that. We'll move now to the panel. Uh, we will have on the panel uh, Nikita Poturaya, who is the head of the Ukrainian delegation to the OSCEPA, for him to share with us uh, his assessment of the situation and also uh, his assessment on the role of the uh, parliamentary assembly in addressing the, some of these challenges. We'll have then uh, um, Ambassador Henning Kubilatsen, who is the uh, OSC project coordinator in Ukraine. Uh, one of the things that were discussed and decided last time was uh, that it was, it was important for parliamentarians to keep engaging to support the continued role of OSC presences on the ground, as, uh, as it was pointed out also in the introductory presentation by uh, the President and Secretary General, uh, SMM, unfortunately, the mandate has been discontinued. Uh, it is important that we now all the support converges on the project of the Office of Project Coordinator so that through, through that uh, the OSC continues to have a channel uh, to uh, 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 continue uh, engaging on the ground and, and assisting in, uh, uh, together with other uh, international players uh, in addressing uh, some of these uh, challenges. And I'm very glad to also um, uh, confirm the presence of uh, Mr. Pascal Hunt, who is the head of the uh, uh, Office of the International uh, Committee of the Red Cross in Ukraine, uh, extremely busy and extremely engaged and present in many, many uh, difficult issues. So I'm also looking forward to hearing uh, from him uh, his assessment of the situation on the ground, which we as we all see, is, uh, uh, is not getting any, any easier, unfortunately. Uh, so let's begin with uh, Mr. Poturayev. Uh, you have the floor, Nikita. Thank you, Ambassador Zanier, uh, dear Madam President, uh, dear Secretary General, distinguished colleagues, dear friends. First of all, I would like to thank you for the possibility to address to you with uh, some important issues. Well, the situation in Ukraine, uh, is um, unfortunately uh, the same. So Russia uh, continuing uh, its war of aggression against Ukraine. They are trying to reach any success, but uh, the any successes they have, uh, these are successes in killing Ukrainian citizens and destroying Ukrainian infrastructure and terrorizing 
people on terminally occupied territories. So they are not successful in their uh, military efforts at all. Um, but I would like also to <clears throat> turn your attention to some other issues. First of all, we appreciate OSCE PA's strong voice in support of Ukraine against the backdrop of Russia's full-scale war launched in uh, February 24th in gross violation of international law and basic principles of the international order. The aggressor state repeatedly violates the provisions of the international humanitarian law set out in the 1949 Geneva Conventions uh, for the Protection of Victims of War. As a result of constant shielding, missiles and air strikes every day, the civilian infrastructure is being destroyed and civilian casualties are on the rise. The behavior of Russian troops in Ukraine is unbelievably brutal. In addition to the crime of aggression, they commit every day numerous war crimes, including bombardments of civilian objects, willful killings, including massive killings, use of prohibited weapons, rapes and other forms of sexual violence, tortures and, and inhuman treatment, unlawful transfer and deportation. I think that, I hope that you've heard that uh, according to some evaluations, up to 1 million of Ukrainian citizens were already deported to Russia, including 200,000 uh, of children. <clears throat> As a result, a number of cities and villages are destroyed to the ground. More than 7,500 civilian facilities damaged or ruined, over 3,800 civilians killed and over 4,000 wounded. It's only according to criminal case materials, or only according to official criminal case materials, including, fortunately, many, children's, many children. These numbers come only from uh, the liberated areas, if you take into account the currently occupied areas, the figures will become much higher. You remember uh, when uh, during uh, one of our meetings, I told you about first evidences uh, from around Kyiv when part of Kyiv region was occupied. And I told you that according to first evidences, there are numerous war crimes and a lot of killed civilians and after we saw we all saw what happened in Bucha, in Borodanka, Irpin, Gostomel and other villages and towns. So I, I just wanted to turn your attention uh, again to the fact when we inform you about something, some horrible things that uh, take place in Ukraine, uh, we sometimes even not uh, we sometimes are even not able to tell you everything because we are informing you about first on the first evidences and the truth in the long run uh, opens much more horrible things. The most dramatic situation still is in Mariupol. It used to be a big prosperous city, as a lot of you know, with around half a million inhabitants and well-developed industry and civilian infrastructure. Now it is completely destroyed by Russian daily bombardment and shelling. A real humanitarian catastrophe is already taking place there. Uh, although a lot of civilians in the long run could leave Mariupol through humanitarian corridors, but still uh, we have an information that a lot of civilians still stay in Azovstal plant. We call on our partners and the OCPA to help our people, including military men from Azovstal to evacuate the wanted and resort to safety places. 
In my opinion, we should focus our activities on the several topics. The time has come for launching official discussion on Russia's expulsion from the OCPA and wider OSCE as well. Even considering the necessity of dialogue that Madam President has mentioned. But I have, again, to repeat my words during our one of our last meetings. We in Ukraine, we understand the dialogue between civilized countries. But we don't understand and we don't really believe in dialogue with uh, newly born fascists and Nazis. <clears throat> the OCPA should lead by example, take resolute position on Russia's exclusion and amend rules of procedures. We strongly encourage the OCPA to dedicate its annual session and concluding declaration to the topic of Russia's war of aggression against Ukraine as a main subject of the plenary session and the meeting itself. Given the ongoing Russia's war, we see a clear need for the adoption of the Assembly's robust declaration at its uh, annual meeting in Birmingham in July, which would significantly contribute the wider international efforts, United Nations, Council of Europe, ICC, etc., etc., aimed at bringing to an end the aggression by Russian Federation against Ukraine in violation of Article 2 of the Charter of the United Nations, unwavering support for the sovereignty, independence, unity, and territorial integrity of Ukraine within its internationally recognized borders extending to its territorial waters. What is, by the way, the answer to Russia's trying to organize a global food crisis? Again, dear colleagues, let me repeat again. The only answer for humanitarian crisis, the only answer for food crisis is only one answer, to stop Putin, to stop Russia, to stop Russians. <clears throat> Um, holding accountable all masterminds and per, 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 sorry, per, per, perpetrates uh, of the crimes of Russia's war of aggression against Ukraine, war crimes, crimes against humanity and other violations of international humanitarian and human rights law. We view as a common duty for the inter, uh, international community to ensure that Russia and its war criminals are held accountable for the horrendous crimes against Ukraine and its people. We count on OSCEPA's active engagement into promoting the need to swiftly and duly investigate Russia's uh, atrocities. The Ver Verkhovna Rada of Ukraine, in its statement of uh, April 14th, recognized the action committed by the armed forces of Russian Federation and its political and military leadership during the last phase of the armed aggression of the Russian Federation against Ukraine, which began February 24th as a genocide of the Ukrainian people. During the adoption of this important document, the Ukrainian parliament was guided by provisions of the Convention uh, on the Prevention and Punishment of the Crime of gen Genocide by the norms of customary international law and taking into account the provisions of the Rome Statute of the International Criminal Court. Court. We call on OSCPA to recognize Russia's actions in Ukraine as genocide of the Ukrainian people. We count, of the, we, we count on the OSC Parliamentary Assembly's support on this important issue. Dear colleagues, one of Russia's key goals in the war it has launched is to destroy Ukraine's economy to transform Ukraine into a failed state which would not be able to resist Russia's pressure and influence. According to the government of Ukraine, the total economic losses in Ukraine due to the full-scale Russian military aggression are more than 600 billion. They are growing every day. The regions affected by the ongoing war were home to the 30% of Ukrainian companies that previously produced more than 50% of our GDP. Now, as the fighting uh, continues, Ukraine is losing between 35 and 50 percent of its economic output. It is important for us to initiate the restoration of its infrastructure in the liberated regions, 
as soon as possible to ensure normal logistics and the operation of enterprises. Currently, the government of Ukraine is working on the Ukraine recovery plan, which will include, among other things, the, the restor restoration and development of infrastructure and housing, structural modernization and restart of the economy, measures to overcome unemployment, to support vulnerable groups of the population, persons in difficult life circumstances as a result of the war, restoration and preservation of cultural heritage. Dear colleagues, finishing my remarks, I would like again to stress on very, uh, I think, understandable and clear thing. Yes, we all want to avoid third nuclear war, but let's face the facts. Putin already has started third world war. Already, we've mentioned today, global food crisis. What is it if not part of Third World War? World refugee crisis, world infrastructure crisis, world energy crisis. What is it if not the Third World War? The Third World War already was started by Vladimir Putin, by Russian Federation. Let's face this fact. We still hope that countries which are members of OEC and OECPA won't support Putin's and, Russian, uh, and Russia's war of aggression against Ukraine uh, by letting them opportunities to escape somehow from sanctions, not helping uh, Russia with weapons, with um, ammunition, or any other help. I mean, first of all, countries uh, which uh, are under strong Russian influence and pressure. Even, even we hope that the country which gave to Russian army an, an opportunity to use its territory for their rockets, for their planes, to kill Ukrainian citizens. We hope that even this country won't let to be part of this war. I mean, won't let to use its army against Ukraine. We and our army and Every Ukrainian citizen now is doing everything we can to stop Russian aggression once and for all. You know that we are not going to sur surrender. We will never surrender because it's a question of our, of our uh, life as nation and as state. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Nikita, for your very vivid account of the uh, situation in Ukraine and also for your analysis and, uh, and your appeal uh, that I, I would argue as being well noted by, by everybody. Uh, let me move on with the second panelist, Ambassador uh, Vilatsen. Uh, dear Henrik, you have the floor. Thank you. Dear Madam President Sederfeld, Secretary General Montella, distinguished participants, members of the OSC Parliamentary Assembly, dear colleagues from the OSC family. Allow me a special thank you to my dear former boss, to Lamberto, for the invitation and for thinking of the OSC Project Coordinator's Office in Ukraine, which I have the honor to lead for the last three and a half years now. I'm currently in Kiev uh, meeting with officials and taking care of business on behalf of the mission with its staff, approximately 110 people, sadly still scattered to the four winds, either displaced uh, throughout Ukraine, some still in the capital and yet others as refugees abroad. I've been asked to speak in this panel discussion about the role of the OSC in addressing the war in Ukraine and its consequences. 
as an OSC official and as an ordinary human being, I certainly have an opinion and strong thoughts on the matter of this senseless, aggressive war and on the disastrous impact and loss of life inflicted on the civilian population of Ukraine. But as the OSCE's project coordinator in Ukraine, I will limit my remarks to the limit my remarks to discussing what we can do, what we are in fact doing, and what we might be able to do after this futile conflict, this futile war has ended. As you know, the um, PCU, as we call it, as we call our mission, it is now the only OSCE field operation still engaged in Ukraine. There's no reason to be proud of this. And in this regard, I fully share OSCE Secretary General Hilga Smith's words when she deeply regretted the loss, recent loss of the OSCE special monitoring mission, the SMM, which for eight years has placed such a crucially important role throughout the whole country, especially in the very troubled East, and which has now been discontinued and is currently being wound down. The role they had negotiating and overseeing windows of silence, for example, to allow for repairs to critical civilian infrastructure on both sides of the contact line and supporting discussions in the trilateral contact group were vital. The fact that no consensus could be reached on extending that mission's mandate is enormously regrettable for the country, for the OSCE, but most of all, for the people of Ukraine. For our part, our mission, the PCU, a smaller operation, contrary to what some may have heard, we never left the country. We maintained our presence despite the outbreak of war on 24 February, even though our international staff were temporarily evacuated and national staff relocated elsewhere in Ukraine and in third countries. I would like to report, and on this matter I'm justifiably proud, the OSCE is continuing to deliver, the mission is continuing to deliver on nearly all of its originally intended programs and projects in all three OSCE dimensions and in line with its mandate, which was set back in 1999. Complementary to this uh, all important core mandate implementation, we have developed an extra budgetary project to uh, provide support for the immediate humanitarian needs of the mission's longstanding partners and the Ukrainian civilian population. The project uh, that was proposed has so far received approximately 3 million euros in funding to date uh, over a few weeks. Uh, more is needed as, uh, as these numbers are just drops in the ocean of humanitarian needs uh, in Ukraine, which will persist for a long time. You may or may not know that our mission has worked in Ukraine for 25 years, equipped with a very broad mandate. We work with the Ukrainian government to support OSCE commitments across all three dimensions, political, military, economic and environmental, and the human dimension. While we've had to adjust some of the work, the mission is currently delivering on nearly all of our 40 ongoing projects. And here I must say, I'm enormously impressed by the tenacity and the endurance of our longstanding Ukrainian partners to also get their regular jobs done in the, in the midst of the catastrophe that's going on. The PCU, our mission, is a flexible and uh, adaptable mission, which is an enormous advantage in the current circumstances, and which also stood us in good um, light during the recent and still ongoing, don't forget, COVID-19 challenge. This flexibility we will put to good use, and we are already doing so with a special humanitarian project, as I mentioned just before. We have uh, initiated this project in the full knowledge that the OSCE is not a humanitarian aid organization and should not be, but in this day, in order to act credibly in Ukraine, in these circumstances, humanitarian assistance, however small the OSCE contribution to this may be, is an aspect that can simply not be ignored. 
the lit the needs humanitar for humanitarian assistance are literally everywhere, as previous speakers also said. We work with more than 20 ministries and government institutions, and every single one has expressed the needs for some form of humanitarian assistance, sometimes limited, sometimes not so limited. So far, we have identified and uh, will support our partners with a number of different uh, assistance items. Uh, I'll just highlight a few examples. It is very simple things such as uh, generators, uh, power banks, uh, flash drives, mobile phones, medical equipment, sleeping bags, roll mats, backpacks, vehicles to transport people around, minibuses transporting IDPs and students and people with special needs, items such as uh, cameras and power banks for uh, migration police departments to facilitate their work to prevent and prosecute those engaged in human uh, be trafficking in human beings at borders uh, and in hub regions with increased numbers of IDPs uh, and women and children fleeing abroad also serves as an example of how you can uh, indirectly uh, support uh, ongoing humanitarian needs and directly too, of course. I am uh, getting to, uh, to the end. Uh, in addition to what I said, we plan to build on our previous experience and efforts that have become even more important uh, in recent weeks. This includes increasing Ukraine's humanitarian mine action capacity by developing a mine action strategy, providing equipment and educate, educating people on the risk of explosive ordnance. Only last week, I was in uh, Croatia speaking at um, uh, an OSCE supporter international demining conference uh, with colleagues from uh, the Ukrainian authorities, where we presented some of the ongoing efforts to help strengthen Ukraine's ability to carry out humanitarian demining. Uh, very recently, uh, the Ukrainian government have uh, requested added support uh, from the OSCE, from the Secretary General to this effect, and we're looking into it. We will also uh, be focusing on combating illicit trafficking of weapons, ammunitions, and explosives, trafficking in human beings, raising awareness of cybersecurity issues for ministries and for the public. While we can only hazard a guess as to what may lie ahead, some things, however, remain crystal clear. The OSCE's founding documents embedded the understanding that democracy, rule of law, human rights, media freedom, and a strong independent civil society are among the key preconditions of security, both for individual countries and more widely in international relations. When we look at the core factors underpinning the strength of Ukraine in dealing with the current challenges, these ideas now seem more than justified. Whatever the outcome of this tragic conflict, there will be a need for continued OSCE engagement in Ukraine, and I believe the mission that I currently lead is well-placed to support this goal. In concluding, I would like to again thank the organizers of this event for inviting me to speak, not least as it has allowed me to talk rather freely about the mission I had and highlight the incredible work which our staff are carrying out every day in such challenging circumstances. I'm sure the organizers yourselves may have had some doubts at least about holding this event in such uncertain times, but I share the idea that one of my Ukrainian staff members wrote uh, to me the other day, and which uh, I shall close my remarks with. If you don't cherish the vision for a better future, you will not overcome the terrors of today. Thank you very much for your attention. Uh, I have a number of meetings I need to conclude, so I will stay on for a while. But Thank you so much. Thanks, uh, thanks to you, uh, Henry, for uh, your commitment, your engagement, and also for carrying the OSC flag in, in Ukraine. So thank you very much and good luck. So thank now we move, we move to the uh, Red Cross, the ICRC, and uh, we have the head of the uh, delegation in Ukraine, uh, Pascal Hunt, who, uh, uh, the, while extremely busy, has accepted to join us for this, uh, for this discussion and to also make our parliamentarians uh, better aware of the challenges the ICRC is encountering on the ground. Uh, Pascal, you have the floor. Thank you, Mr. Heather. Ladies and gentlemen, excellencies. Yes, indeed, we are confronted with a full-fledged humanitarian tragedy. 
And I think, as it was said before, the situation is deteriorating day by day. The level of death, of destruction, of, of suffering of civilians affected by this international conflict is abhorrent and unacceptable. Cities are transformed into battlefields. Critical infrastructure are destroyed and some of them are beyond repair. They will need to be rebuilt. The displacement of population fleeing hostilities is unprecedented in recent history. And this conflict has created and is still creating a humanitarian disaster here, but also it has cascading effects around the globe, and notably in terms of access to basic commodities and, and to food security, affecting the most vulnerable population across the continent. And the ICRC is already witnessing this effect in Africa, in the Middle East, in Asia, in Afghanistan, in other countries where the population is already made vulnerable by, by other armed conflict. In Ukraine, the ICRC has massively scaled up its operation. Of course, we play a role as neutral intermediary. We have heard uh, recently uh, on safe passages for Mariupol. We have been involved in other type of operation like that more discreetly. Uh, and we, are, uh, we were involved in, in, in evacuating those civilians, uh, but this is not enough. Uh, many more such operations are required. And we, we repeatedly call on parties to allow this type of operation. We were able to evacuate six, 700 civilians uh, from Mariupol and, and some of them from Azov style. We have huge concern for the wounded combatants uh, in Azov style today. They are protected under the Geneva Convention. They deserve to, be, to receive medical care. We are, of course, involved in, in, in critical protection uh, activities, in discussion uh, with the two sides, emergency assistance, uh, but we also support the first elements of resilience and, uh, and reconstruction. And I'll give you one example. Uh, during the war, the, the, the water system of Bucha and Irpin were destroyed. People didn't have any access to water. And the ICIC, together with the local authorities and the, 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 the water board, what we call the border canal, uh, we have completed a project to connect the water system of the city of Kiev to the city of Bucha and Irpin. And thanks to that project, done together with the authorities, the people of Bucha and Irpin have access to water today again. And this project was completed. So it shows you that even during very tense situation, this type of project, uh, industrial project, uh, can be conducted. And we have agreements across Ukraine with more than 25 cities. And thanks to this cooperation with the authorities, more than 8.8 .8 million people have access to fresh water, despite the conflict, as I speak today, thanks to the Red Cross. I would also try to commend the work of the volunteers of the Ukrainian Red Cross, because they are working in extremely difficult conditions together with us in front line, in hotspot, in hostilities, and risking their life to be close to the, to the population and to provide, to provide assistance. Let me conclude with one or two words. You know, this frontline humanitarian organization, of course, is providing vital support uh, to the people, and this is required. But this is also a vital stabilization factor, you know? and a small building block in the dialogue. And we have seen that in, in the trust building relationship, doing a negotiating a corridor safe passage, when it works, it helps and it opens the door for future such operation. But, but at the end, political problems require political solution. And we have to be careful not to mixing up humanitarian action and political solution. So those living through the horrors of this conflict, they need urgent and pragmatic solution for now and for the future. They need tangible action in order for their suffering to end as soon as possible and for the country to be rebuilt and in order to live in safety. This
this is the most pressing need for most of them. But this population, they also need the strong support from the OC member states to support principled humanitarian action in Ukraine. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Hunt, for uh, your for sharing with uh, with us uh, your uh, perceptions of the situation, which obviously is uh, remains dra dramatic. Um, uh, I think it's important also the work you do in uh, opening up uh, uh, small strands of dialogue to uh, address local situations, uh, and hopefully that will translate also at some point, and hopefully sooner rather than later into a broader uh, uh, political uh, political dialogue. Uh, hopefully leading to solutions. You also highlight something that seems to me a recurrent theme in this discussion, which is the global impact of this uh, of this conflict. And this is something we must uh, all keep in mind and uh, and try to address in our in our discussions. And we've taken note also of your appeal to the OSCE uh, to provide from our angle whatever support we can. So thank you very much. Congratulations and good luck for your important work. And thank you for joining us. I know how busy time it is for you. Thank, Thank you very much. So now we move to uh, the debate. Uh, as you see, we have uh, uh, quite a number, already 14 requests for the floor. I imagine more will be coming. So I would like to encourage everybody to be as synthetic as you can. Uh, the first uh, speaker is uh, Senator Cardin uh, from the US. Uh, uh, Senator, you have the floor. Good, after, good, good morning for you. Mr. Secretary General, first, thank you very much. Uh, President Stiderfeld, thank you for arranging uh, this opportunity. It's extremely important. As chairman of the US, US Helsinki Commission, as a longtime member of the OSC Parliamentary Assembly, I'm very proud of the unity among the OSC states supporting Ukraine's sovereignty. We demonstrate that through our words and our actions by making it clear Russia has violated all Helsinki principles providing Ukraine with the means to defend itself from the Russian invasion, isolating the perpetrators through sanctions and holding them accountable for their war crimes, and providing humanitarian aid. An estimated 12 million displaced Ukrainians, as we heard today, as many as 25 million in need of humanitarian aid. Let me just inform our colleagues that the United States Congress will approve this week $40 billion of additional help to the Ukrainians for their military and humanitarian needs. The U.S. Helsinki Commission has held a series of hearings in regards to the Ukrainian situation. We had one on accountability for war crimes, and we had the experts from the Moscow Mechanism testify before our commission. They pointed out that the OSCE can be invaluable in helping the collection of evidence to hold those responsible accountable. We had another hearing on the vulnerability of displaced uh, Ukrainians uh, being uh, subject to human trafficking. The OSCE has considerable expertise to prevent these vulnerabilities. Let's use it. We also was pointed out at our hearing that the large scale deportation of Ukrainians to Russia. Russia's numbers are that 1 million Ukrainians have been deported uh, to uh, Russia, including 200,000 children. It is very clear from our hearings that these are not evacuees, but rather forced deportations, separating victims from their national identity. My colleagues, that's genocide. We need to act. It cannot be business as usual. We need to reestablish the OSCE special monitoring mission and urge Russia and to, to release all the detained staff. The chair in office should appoint a special representative on the war, and I might point out that the OSCE can do many things, including serve as one of the few places for dialogue with Russian officials, but the organization has no future if it does not defend and promote the original Helsinki principles that first set us all on the road to a Europe whole, free, and at peace. Only the Helsinki principles can get us back on that road. One last point. The OSCE Parliamentary Assembly is uniquely positioned. While our counterparts in Vienna have often been stymied by the denial of consensus, we have been able to act by overwhelming support for Ukraine, calling out the Kremlin for clear, gross, and uncorrected violations of all Helsinki principles. Let us take advantage of our ability and let us act. Thank you. 
Thank you very much, Senator. Um, we have now uh, Mr. Pavlo, Pavlo Frolov from uh, Ukraine. Mr. Frolov, you have the floor. Thank you, dear Parliament. Meeting its obligation to documents of our organization, Helsinki Final Act, sovereign equality, refraining from the threat or use of force, territorial integrity of states, respect for human rights and fundamental freedoms and others. All these principles turn out to be empty in practice, mere words on paper. Russia has coached and obliterated them, destroyed them with bombs and missiles responsible for deaths of thousands of Ukrainian civilians. At the date of uh, 11th of May, the, uh, these are uh, 226 children killed and 417 children injured. These are official, although uh, re regretfully not final numbers of this horrific war. Determining accurate data in zones of active hostilities, temporarily occupied territories and recently liberated territories is still in progress. I'm certain you all have seen the torches, executions of civilians, raping of children in front of their mothers and other atrocities done by the Russian army. In occupied Bucha, Hostomel, Barodyanka, and many other Ukrainian towns. I firmly believe that you have considered bringing those inhuman beasts that commit genocide of Ukrainians to justice, particularly those that gave out the orders, meaning the senior military and political leadership of Russia. Today, this is the most important objective for all international organizations and for OEC as well. We have to unite our efforts to create an international tri tribunal by the design of one in Nuremberg so that modern Nazis fascists from Russia will be punished. So that we give the powerful message to the entire world, world and uh, to the carnal dictators in the making, the international community shall not allow mass murders and genocide to happen and be unpunished. Democracy must be able to defend itself. This is why I once again repeat, the Ukraine needs heavy artillery, heavy armor, air defense systems, attack aircraft, and undoubtedly full energy embargo on Russia in order to stop the aggression. And finally, dear colleagues, we absolutely cannot sit at the 29th annual session in Birmingham together with representatives of Russia, the terrorist state, the aggressor country that shows total contempt of rules of the international law. This is why I demand the suspension of Russia's membership in the OEC parliamentary assembly. Should the procedure not have a mechanism to adopt this decision, let us amend it and stop interparliamentary cooperation with the murder, murders. Glory to Ukraine. Thank you very much. Uh, thank, thank you very much. Uh, we continue with the list. Now I have Mrs. Nino Yubashvili uh, from Georgia. <laughs> Dear colleagues, uh, can you hear me? First of all, we had some technical issue and I want to check if you... Yes, yes it's okay, we can hear you. Okay. Good afternoon, Madam President, Mr. Um, Secretary General, uh, General and all colleagues. Um, uh, and thank you very much for this opportunity to address you uh, on behalf of Georgian delegation. As we speak now, uh, uh, Russia's unprovoked and unjustified war of aggression against Ukraine which has entered uh, already the third month. This war 
which brought back to the wars of conquest in Europe endangers the fundamental principles of European security architecture and the rule-based international order. And Georgia strongly condemns Russia's continued and unjustified aggression against our friendly nation, brotherly nation, Ukraine, in blatant violation of the Charter of the United Nations and Helsinki Final Act. Unfortunately, it's not cannot be discussed as an isolated case because aggression and war we are facing now, we have already seen in 2008. Georgia's territorial, uh, uh, territorial uh, integrity was also blatantly violated and we became the victims of further Russian aggression and occupation, which we face even now. And since then, Russia has continued its illegal occupation of Georgian territories and it has an intensified hybrid warfare against us. Regrettably, by that time, international community failed to give an adequate response to Russia's continued aggressive behavior, a response that would have been prevented the same situation in Europe right now. Now, there is a chance to uh, make the difference between right and wrong. Russia's renewed military aggression against its neighbors must be met with undeniable unity and resolve. We have to speak one voice and make it clear that states should be punished for exercise the sovereign right to choose their uh, own present and future and foreign policy path. There is no place for military invasions in Europe and uh, those who do not follow international rules must be held responsible. Russia's medieval style brutal war continues to inflict devastating damage and uh, human tragedy, uh, tragedies in Ukraine. Georgia spares no effort together with international community to ensure though all available international legal instruments that perpetrators of those atrocities are brought to justice. We call on Russia to stop its unprovoked aggression again and comply with the order in, of International Court of Justice and will draw all its troops and forces and armored armaments from the territory of Ukraine. This is even more important now but the latest developments in our region once again prove the keeping conflict so-called uh, protracted and are not solution and peace is not guaranteed. Russia uses unresolved conflicts on Europe's eastern flank as a tool of pressure on the West and its neighbors. And in conclusion, I'd like to reiterate Georgia's unwavering support for the independence, sovereignty and territorial integrity of Ukraine within its international recognized borders, including Crimea, of course, Donbas, and Ukraine's navigational rights on, on its territorial waters. So once again, thank you very much. And thank you very much for our, your attention. Uh, thank, thanks to you. Can you move up this to the list? Yes. Yeah, uh, now the next is uh, Mrs. Vilia uh, Aleknaite Abramikieme from Lithuania. Thank you. Thank you, dear ambassador. Uh, dear colleagues, dear representatives of the international organizations, first of all, I'd like to thank all those who are helping Ukraine in this extreme, uh, terrible situation, as well as our President Margareta Sederfeld for her visits to the refugees camps in Poland, in Moldova. Each, each uh, sign of our solidarity uh, is very important for the people of Ukraine. Uh, I want to say that yesterday the Lithuanian parliament unanimously voted for the resolution uh, which acknowledged uh, Russia's aggression in Ukraine as uh, genocide. Uh, as well, we expressed our opinion that Russia behaves as uh, uh, not only aggressor, but uh, terrorist state. Uh, we've he heard already some reaction of Russia's side, but you know, uh, the United Nations Convention on the Prevention of uh, and Punishment of the Crime of Genocide specifies five criteria of genocide. And uh, if you go point by point through the text of this, of this uh, convention, you would uh, find that um, all five criteria 
uh, have been uh, met, met by Russia, by Russia's behavior in Ukraine. And um, following uh, the, our example, maybe parliamentary assembly could recognize Russia's behavior as genocide. Uh, our dear colleague Mikita Poturayev said repeated uh, that Ukraine will never surrender. Dear colleagues, they cannot surrender because uh, according the ideology of Russia, official state ideology, uh, not only Ukraine as a state, but uh, Ukrainians as a nation have no right to exist. And this hatefulness uh, can be compared only maybe to the ideology of Hitler and Nazis against Jews. Uh, because Jews were killed for being a Jew. Ukrainians nowadays are killed for being Ukrainian. So they cannot surrender. Uh, and we cannot surrender uh, witnessing such uh, intention of Russian officials. Uh, today is 77th day of uh, aggression. Uh, Lithuania, uh, at, at the fourth day of aggression, applied to the International Court of Justice against Russia and uh, offered 100,000 euro for the Bureau of, of the Prosecutor. And now more than 40 states already have joined uh, this case and prosecutor is acting uh, in a proper way. We, I can only ask more and more states to join it. Uh, after Ukrainian government applies to us, we will uh, join to the uh, other case, uh, International Court of Justice, of course. Um, it's very important to say that um, uh, this accountability for crimes, for war crimes, for crimes against humanity applies not only to those who directly committed these crimes, but it should apply to those who uh, order uh, to start the war, who provided this terrible military ideology to Russian nation. Uh, so this is why the Parliamentary Assembly of uh, Council of Europe uh, has proposed uh, to establish uh, international tribunal, a special international tribunal with authority to prosecute those who have committed the crime of aggression against Ukraine. Uh, and we pointed it in our resolution uh, of Lithuanian parliament yesterday. Uh, I'm sure that uh, after terrible crime of Holocaust, uh, when the world uh, made pledge never again, we are obliged not to allow such terrible crimes uh, to remain unaccountable and, and punished. Uh, this is why um, Lithuania, uh, together with Ukraine and Poland and uh, Eurojust, Eurojust uh, established a special joint investigation team. Uh, and uh, we are sure that um, all uh, OECE, at least European nation states, uh, will join this initiative. Uh, our prosecutors are um, uh, working uh, very actively. Lithuanians, Poles, together with the Ukrainians. And all uh, these um, materials, all this evidence has been provided to the platform to the platform established uh, by this joint investigation team. Uh, I think that uh, this second Holocaust uh, should be punished and will be punished. Uh, we cannot allow uh, in the 21st century uh, this annihilation 
of Ukrainians. Because uh, if we allow it, if we close our eyes, uh, it will come uh, to other states too. And OEC can contribute to the effort uh, of the international community to prevent such crimes now and in the future. OEC can even become part of this future international criminal tribunal. Uh, of course, it will be a specific institution, independent institution, following the example and precedence of Nuremberg, uh, uh, other precedents, and uh, we should have such tools for punishing the criminals. Otherwise, you know, <laughs> all our job, all our work um, will not help to come back to Helsinki principles. Thank you. Thank you very much, Vilja, for your presentation. And uh, now another important voice from Ukraine, Artur Gerasimov. Uh, good to see you. You have the floor, Artur. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Dean and Madam President, dear Secretary General, dear Lamberta, dear colleagues. Uh, first of all, uh, I want to say thank you for all participating states who supported Ukraine, who supported Ukraine not only by voice, but who supported Ukraine, first of all, by steps, by providing additional weapons for Ukrainian army, because I told it many times before, and I want to repeat it right now. Now in Ukraine, battle not only for Ukraine. The battle is for your houses, for your families, for your streets, and for your countries. It's a true, and we understood it, because the chain didn't start in Ukraine. Chain started in Chechnya, in Georgia, in Transnistria, and only because of no prompt response from the European community and, let's say, democratic world community, now we have this big war. Also, I want to say thank you for OECAPA, who now keeping in air as a topic number one, this situation, this invasion. Also, I want to say thank you for all the rapporteurs who after the bureau included a lot of new words into the reports of all three committees related to Russian invasion to Ukraine. It's extremely important. About the annual session, it's for me and I hope for everybody understandable that uh, Russian invasion must be topic number one in all three dimensions, because it's not only again about Ukraine. When we're speaking about the first committee, of course, it's about territorial integrity and sovereignty of the states, because now destroyed the real international law which was kept for many decades after the second world war in europe especially when we are speaking about second committee it's not only about dramatical situation in ukraine i mean not only economical ecological humanitarian but also about food crisis worldwide because now russia is doing a lot of steps toward that when I was speaking about third committee, human rights violation in Ukraine, genocide, genocide. And uh, I want to pay your attention that uh, unfortunately, Russia wants to destroy all Ukraine, including all citizens of Ukraine. Because just for your information, many, Majority, not many, majority of the missiles attacks, majority of the artillery attacks, not against the Ukrainian army. They are against civilian infrastructure. They are destroying electricity stations. They are trying to destroy railway stations. They are trying to destroy it. Uh, mobile communication, they're trying to destroy um, uh, stations who provided heating for the cities. This purpose to destroy citizens. The best, unfortunately, and the most dramatic example is Mariupin right now. And 
the examples of genocide, this is not only Bucha, European, wars in Baradan, Kenya, Kiev. This is, of course, Mariupol, where we have tens of thousands of Ukrainians killed, I mean, civilians killed. But also, you need to be aware that these villages and small towns, which were freed by Ukrainian army near Kharkiv, during the last week, during the last two weeks, showed for us the same picture, the picture of genocide, of killing civilians, of raping, of uh, killing children, the same like was in Bucha. So it means that this is the equal approach for Russian army all around occupied territory of Ukraine. And uh, we found this in Kyiv Oblast after it was freed by Ukrainian army. Now we have found it in Kharkiv Oblast after these villages and small towns were freed by Ukrainian army. And when we are speaking about what we have to do about our organization, topic number one during annual session. Second one, I think we need to use this moment for rebirth of our organization, of our parliamentary assembly. And now I also want to um, make a request to Madam President, to our uh, Rules and Procedures Committee about changing of procedure. We sent our proposals about the following issue, which was discussed during the bureau meeting, the last one that if the participated state of OVC started military aggression or genocide, the rights of those delegation in PA has to be postponed. And uh, now we kindly ask our Rules and Procedures Committee to discuss this topic, to make the decision, and we need to make this change to the rule of procedure, I strongly believe in that, during our annual session, during our standing committee meeting in July in Birmingham. And the last but not least, about responsibility. And before it, I want to add just one more thing. When we are speaking about uh, parliaments, national parliaments of participated states, uh, I kindly ask you, not just keep sanctions against aggressor country, but to increase them. Because again, now tens of thousands killed in Ukraine, but before was MH17, before was Georgia, before was Nimtsov, before was Skripal case. This is, I think, the strong evidence that only sanctions and increase of sanctions can keep Russia from continuation of such steps. And the last one important about responsibility. All of you saw the pictures from Bucha, this genocide. All world saw the pictures from Bucha. Just for your information, Russian troops, exact, exactly those units who provided this genocide in Pucha entered the Ukrainian territory from the territory of Belarus. Thank you very much. Thank you, Arthur. Very disturbing, many of the things you told us. Uh, the President, the Secretary General, will have taken note also of your suggestion and that of, uh, of a colleague who, pre who preceded you. Uh, so that will be also for uh, uh, the members of the Parliamentary Assembly to decide on the way forward. Um, okay, next uh, speaker is uh, Mrs. Uh, Alexandra Tavares de Moura uh, from Portugal. Thank you, Mr. Ambassador Robert Montella, President of PA, Margaret Siderf, dear colleagues. Thank you for providing us with another opportunity for a debate on possible initiatives in light of this war and discuss the impact of uh, civilian population and the way that HOSH can help promote security and peace in Ukraine and in the other countries of Europe. 
After two and a half months of war, and many cities, hospitals, schools, streets have been destroyed, and so many lives lost, we can't forget the violation of the principles of Geneva Conventions and the war crimes that are being committed. Along with this, we must have the concern about the increasing risk of human trafficking of refugees and displaced people. This requires meeting immediate needs, guarantee access to childcare, education and employment, and investing in anti-trafficking structures to monitor high-risk sectors of the economy. This should constitute a common effort for all of OSH countries. We must also worry about the increase of tension in Transnistria in Moldova. We must reopen our channel for dialogue and access the risks for security in this region. On the other hand, we must start walking towards the path of rebuilding Ukraine. And as we know, the Portuguese prime minister condemns the brutal invasion of Ukraine by the Russian Federation. And we consider that this is an acceptable act of war in the 21st century. Portugal is going to support to rebuild of Ukraine. At this point, we have received 36,000 refugees. We have created new forms to welcome them and to guarantee that they have social security, access to medical systems and schools, and we provided Portuguese language courses because this is the simplest way to help them getting a job. At this moment, Portugal has 25,000 jobs to offer, and we have 2,000 employees, most of them in tourism and restoration. Mr. President, we are committed to helping Ukraine, and we know that we are not alone. But for us, we must guarantee the diplomatic dialogue to reach peace, the sooner the better, and stop all the killing and trauma of the children, women, men, and seniors of Ukraine and Europe and NATO countries. We need to act now. Slava Ukraine. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, again, uh, now from Portugal, we have Mr. Luis Grassa. You have the floor, sir. We cannot hear you, Mr. Grassa. There must be some technical issues. Maybe we'll try to return to you a bit later. I don't know if you are listening uh, now. Yes, yes, Thank yes. You. No, Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Dear um, Ambassador, thank you. The Notre Ville Europe, l'Angleterre a fait le premier pas. Et pour son exemple, c'est colère, elle a dit au peuple, vous êtes libre. La France a fait le second pas. Et elle a dit au peuple, vous étiez souverain. Maintenant, faisons, la, faisons le troisième pas. Mr. Grass, I'm sorry to interrupt you, but we don't have French as a language for this meeting, so I'm not sure how many I'm, people will follow you. I'm just finishing. And, and to ensemble, disons au peuple, vous étiez frères. The Ambassador Zanier, Madam President, Margaret Sederfeld, Mr. Secretary General Robert Montel, these words, uh, were spoken by the great uh, French writer Victor Hugo at the first Universal Congress for Peace. In the 19th century, when inspired by the spring of peoples, the idea of Europe as a great and united nation of freedom emerged, this humanist utopia gained strength and momentum with the holding in 1849 of the first Universal Congress for Peace, shared by himself, Victor Hugo. After Paris, there were followed a regular series of international congress, interparliamentary meetings, community plenary sessions that as a whole represent the root of the legacy of the ideal of perpetual peace that marks until today the imagination of successive generations of Europeans. The infamous and fair and unjustified war in Ukraine confronted us with the fragility 
of this great and free nation of peace that we call Europe, that the romantic and utopian Europeans projected in the 19th and 20th centuries, and that my generation thought that one day would encompass the whole planet and all the nations and the world, like in John Lennon's song, could be as one, or simply can, could be called humanity. When the brutality of the violence of war erodes the stability of peace, concord, and uh, international law, we'll, we would like to suggest that the uh, OSCE can organize and promote a new Universal Congress for Peace that could desirably and preferably take place in Ukraine itself. I understand that we have to maintain sanctions against Russia, that governments have to support military Ukraine, but we have to stop the war and return to the force of international law and diplomatic peace talks. As we believe that parliaments are instruments for dialogue between people and following the past visits to Kyiv of the Secretary General of the United Nations, Antonio Guterres, the President of the European Commission, Ursula von der Leyen, several Prime Ministers, and the President of the European Parliament, Roberta Metzola, have already all of them been in Ukraine. What better way to mobilize citizens and the free world for Russia condemnation, for the urgent need to stop the war and start peace talks, than the OEC promote, if possible, in Ukraine, a new Universal Congress for Peace, open for parliaments of all the world, politicians and religious leaders, artists and writers. Mr. Ambassador, Madam President, let us raise the voice of freedom. Let us join forces in a new Universal Peace Congress, because peace and freedom will, by always, win over war and tyranny. My solidarity for the people of Ukraine. Thank you. Sorry. Thank you very much for your presentation. As we proceed with the list of speakers, may I just draw the attention of everyone uh, to a, a message in the chat by the Secretary General who refers to some proposals that were made on changing the rules of procedures. Uh, so the, the, uh, uh, this, uh, this, in the chat you will find uh, uh, the procedure that needs to be followed to amend the rules of procedure. Um, next speaker on the list is uh, Congressman Steve Cohen from the U.S. Uh, Representative Cohen, you have the floor. Thank you very much, and I appreciate the OSCPA having this important discussion, particularly about our coming meeting in Birmingham, England. The Americans will come with a strong delegation, and we'll be strongly supportive of the people of Ukraine and the European Union and the OSCE. America turned its heads away from Europe. It turns its head away from the OSCE during the administration that we just got rid of. We had four years in the dark and we're out of the dark and we're in the light. And President Biden and his administration and the Democrats in Congress, but in this circumstance, a bipartisan group in Congress support the OSCE, support what we are doing in Ukraine and support democracy around the world and oppose Putin and Belarusia. Uh, at, the, at the meetings in Birmingham, we need to do the strongest things we can to show our support for Ukraine, our support for democracy, and against these countries, Russia and Belarus, who have violated the Helsinki Accords and every principle enunciated therein. They are members of our group, but they're not members in spirit. They're not members in fact. They are members only on paper at this point. We have seen what is clearly a genocide taking place in Ukraine. Putin made it clear when he said he was going to engage in a special military operation. The special military operation is to destroy the Ukrainian people, to kill as many as possible, to take what is reportedly a million Ukrainians to Russia, where they will be indoctrinated and, and into Russian culture and to become, try to make them Russian citizens. The raping and killing of women, to the extent, as some Russian soldiers said to women, that they would never be able to reproduce and have children, Ukrainian children in the future. This is a horrific assault on the Ukrainian people and the Ukrainian culture. Cities destroyed, reduced to rubble, 
cultural sites destroyed, people, children, young, old, you name it, murdered and raped. We had several people come before our OSCE, our Helsinki Commission in the United States, testifying, and it's clear this is a genocide and we need to declare it such in Birmingham. And we need to do all we can to encourage the free world to come together. This is a fight for all of our democracies. We must thank the Ukrainian people, hail their, their valor, their courage, unlike any we've seen in recent times in standing up to this oppressive force and this illegal war, AKA special military operation. They are fighting for us. They're giving their lives. They're giving so much. We need to give them all we can. In the United States, we've got great problems with inflation. That's causing political problems for the Democrats. We could lose our elections next fall and lose the House and Senate. And if we do, we've got some dark forces taking over our nation. And we will not, we'll have to depend on President Biden's veto and his strength in this administration. But we are taking the course we need to take in supporting Ukraine. Last night, we passed a in the House, the bipartisan, strong bipartisan vote, support for Ukraine, not just militarily, but human rights, monies for the refugees, for the countries surrounding Ukraine that are being uh, taking so many refugees, and for support of them and for rebuilding of Ukraine, and they're moving our, our, our embassy back into Kyiv. And we sp spent close to $40 billion in that bill. This is not helping with the inflation fight, the fight with Russia, where they've cut off and we've decided not to import Russian oil and the changes with the Russian gas supply has caused inflation to go up around the, the world. We can't control the Chinese problem with the shutdowns and the supply chain. We are suffering from this and we may suffer politically, but we are committed regardless to doing what is right for Ukraine and for the people of the world and for democracy. This is our stand. This should be the stand of the OSCE and I know it will be. I am proud to be a member of the Helsinki Commission to participate in the OSCPA. I will be in Birmingham with a strong voice, the United American voice for support for Ukraine against genocide and to stand up to both Russia and Belarus who have launched this invasion, supported this invasion and, and stopped on human rights in their countries and been against people having the right to vote in free elections. Thank you all for participating. I'm honored to be with you and glory to Ukraine. Thank you, Congressman. Uh, next speaker is Mrs. Barbara Bartos from Poland. Dziękuję. Uh, dear colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, a lot of words have been said about the terrible war, but I believe that we should do our best to condemn firmly the violent Russian military aggression and we should do our best to denounce its tragic consequences. Thousands of uh, killed and injured civilians, uh, including children, uh, rapes against vulnerable women, millions of refugees and injured internally displaced people, ruined country and infrastructure. These are not only media reports. This is real suffering and dramas of ordinary people, our neighbors, and fortunately, in the case of this war, there were not only empty and unreflexive words of support, the uh, international community of the free world has provided a tangible support driven by the need of solidarity to oppose the evil. Considering the findings regarding the atrocities committed by a Russian military against mili civilian population, it is important to support any international investigation mechanisms to prosecute war crimes committed in Ukraine invaded by Russian army. The OEC and the United Nations have an invaluable role to play as the parliamentary assembly. We should talk in all our contacts in all respective international organizations and their representative. The question of accountability for the violation by the Russian Federation of the International Humanitarian Law and Human Rights in Ukraine. Probably it would be good 
to find a solution to expel the Russian Federation from the OSCE uh, as the head of the Russian of the Ukrainian delegation has mentioned and the whole Ukrainian delegation has mentioned so, as a chair in office of the OSCE Poland uh, took a firm stance to defend the values and principles of the organization. We do our best in order to use the unique expertise of the organization to build confidence and dialogue, to escalate tensions and to uh, act as a mediator and broker. Poland is committed to avoid the sabotage and blocking of the organization by Russia. We deplore uh, the obstruction by Russia, which opposed the extension of the mandate of the special monitoring mission in Ukraine after the 31 of March. However, we will be flexible in order to ensure that the resources and the capacities of the mission be used in future. Don't forget that the protection of the civil population should be of our our prime priority, each of us and every country uh, represented here has its task to do. And I'm proud of Poland and Poles. We have received more than 3 million our Ukrainian neighbors and provided them with very tangible support. We have a comprehensive support system, whether it's material, legal or humanitarian. More than 1 million of Ukrainian citizens have already got the PESEL identification number and they have an access to public health, social assistance, assistance and education. We support actively, whether financially or materially, Ukrainians who stay in Ukraine are facing the war. Remember, let's never be indifferent to human suffering and evil. Let's not forget the crimes committed now, right now, by Russia in Ukraine. Thank you. Thank you, Mrs. Bartur. Uh, we have now Mr. Andrei Savinik from Belarus. Уважаемый господин председатель, меня слышно? Уважаемый господин, меня слышно? Я буду говорить по-русски с вашего Сегодня мы обсуждаем крайне важную и крайне болезненную тему. Любые политические игры на этой трагедии недопустимы и разрушительны для будущего мира. Попробую поделиться с вами своими соображениями. Это факт, что многие страны НАТО непосредственно вовлечены в военные действия, поставляя украинским властям вооружение, разведывательную информацию, допуская проникновение своих граждан в Украину в качестве наемников. Это безответственная политика, которая затягивает конфликт и приносит дополнительные страдания простым гражданам Украины. Этот конфликт тянется с 2014 года, уже более 8 лет. Складывается впечатление, что единственным решением этого конфликта на Украине может стать только немедленная капитуляция украинских властей без каких-либо предварительных условий. Это станет решающим шагом для спасения жизней граждан Украины. Этот шаг позволит России помочь провести денацификацию Украины, оказать помощь в проведении новых выборов, для наблюдения за которыми будет приглашена и парламентская ассамблея ОБСЕ, и другие международные наблюдатели. Это путь создания суверенной Украины, свободой от давления зарубежных центров, свободной от диктата экстремистских и олигархических структур, которые финансируются внешними силами за счет ограбления украинского народа. Открытым остается вопрос, как после капитуляции и возвращению к мирной жизни 
обеспечить восстановление Украины. Я думаю, что эта задача может быть решена за счет государств, которые сегодня поставляют украинской власти оружие. При этом объем выплат на восстановление может быть организован пропорционально объему поставленных вооружений. Данные об этих поставках имеются, так что долю ответственности каждой страны легко определить. Это единственно честный путь для защиты интересов украинского народа. Все остальное – это попытки извлечь выгоду из чужой беды. Благодарю вас за внимание. Some problems with the translation because it was, I don't know if it was a, uh, either coming from, uh, uh, hold on a second here, original, uh, coming from uh, Minsk, the translation, I don't know, we could hear, so we've heard some of your speech, but I see Ambassador Zania returning to moderation. Ambassador Zania, I leave it off. I apologize, I was trying to deal with the problem, but I couldn't, uh, uh, so we all missed uh, the, I mean, uh, All of those like me who do not speak Russian uh, uh, they have missed uh, the, the, uh, this, this presentation. Maybe we can find a way to uh, perhaps circulate a statement or something. We'll, be, uh, you know, we'll follow up on this and uh, apologies. It's a technical problem. No problem. We will, we will, send, uh, we will send our statement uh, in English uh, then. That's, uh, that's very kind of you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Savini. Um, so next, uh, next speaker is Mr. Radu Mihai Mikhail from Romania. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair. Dear Mrs. President, ladies and gentlemen, dear colleagues, uh, the Russian military aggression against Ukraine poses serious challenges for the entire European security. Russia failed to abide by key obligations under international law and OAC principles and commitments. Since February 24th, we are witnessing dreadful human suffering caused by the Russian aggression, and the humanitarian situation continues to deteriorate. The war has caused the world's fastest growing displacement crisis since the Second World War. In Romania alone, almost one million Ukrainian refugees have crossed the border from Ukraine. Furthermore, Romania is worried about the impact of Russia's military aggression in Ukraine on the Republic of Moldova. Side by side with international partners, we try to help the Republic of Moldova to tackle the refugee crisis, improve energy security, economic situation, border management, combat corruption, in order to support the government to advance its pro-European reform agenda and improve the economic situation of the country avoiding the risk of decreasing popularity for the pro-European president and government, who are the persons who guarantee the uh, peace and stability in the region. We are appalled by the increasing number of reports pointing out war crimes and crimes against humanity committed in Ukraine. No perpetrator of atrocities in Ukraine should remain unpunished. We welcome the unified response of the international community in support of accountability for the violations of international law in Ukraine. We support targeted efforts such as the establishment of the Independent International Commission of Inquiry on Ukraine and the activation of the Moscow mechanism of the OSCE. We also became member of the Group of Friends of Accountability following the aggression against Ukraine aimed at contributing to the mapping and awareness of existing and emerging accountability processes and evidence collection initiatives. Moreover, Romania joined other states, parties to the Rome Statute, in a referral to the prosecutor of the International Criminal Court to investigate any acts of war crimes, crimes against humanity and genocide alleged to have occurred on the territory of Ukraine. Recently, the Romanian government approved a voluntary contribution of 100,000 euros in response to the ICC prosecutor's appeal to state parties to support with adequate resources the priority areas of action of this office against the background of the high level of workload, including the new investigation on the territory of Ukraine. Dear colleagues, before concluding, let me please underline Romania's readiness to contribute 
to post-war reconstruction with Ukraine. We already have to think about what needs to be done, the ways in which we will be able to help Ukraine rebuild. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Mr. Mikhail. Uh, next speaker is Mrs. Eugenia Kravchuk from Ukraine, please. Um, thank you, dear colleagues. Uh, first of all, I'd like to react uh, to uh, this so-called speech delivered by head of uh, Belarus delegation. Uh, the main message of the speech was Ukraine has to surrender and to uh, capitulate. Well, uh, I'm sure that this speech was not written by himself. It was written uh, in Moscow uh, because Belarus became proxy uh, country of, uh, of Russian Federation. Well, here's an answer uh, from Ukraine. We will never capitulate. And that's the answer to uh, suggestions about uh, peace talks, peace conference. That's the peace talks that Russia wants uh, to have. They won't have a uh, capitulation. But uh, the, any talks can be only after we have the victory on the battlefield. Uh, and that's why we're thankful for the countries that uh, has the courage to give us this aid, to give us weapons, because we're not defending just us. We're defending uh, security in Europe, we're defending you, we're defending your kids as well, because missiles are not flying to your countries, they're flying to my country. And my eight years old child has to go to basement and not to go to school. Um, and uh, getting closer to the points I wanted to deliver, um, I wanted to cover um, some topics about security of women and children. Um, here's the part of my security in Ukraine. Uh, this is uh, tourniquet. Tunicat stops blood in the case of, of the wound. I have to carry it, to carry it in my purse every day because any uh, moment missile can hit any corner of Ukraine coming from Caspian Sea, from Black Sea, from Belarusian territory, hitting civilians. We can't even tell you uh, how many, you know, the, the number of civilians were killed because uh, uh, we, we can't get access to the occupied, uh, temporarily occupied territories. But only in Kyiv region, uh, we found 1,200 bodies with traces of torture, of rape. Uh, their hands were tied. They were executed uh, to the head. Uh, and that's going on in the center of Europe uh, in the 21st century. In Mariupol, the death toll of civilians can go up as 20,000 of people, 20,000 of people. Russians are trying to cover the traces of their war crimes. They're bringing mobile crematoriums to burn the bodies. Uh, they're uh, making grave, uh, mass graves uh, near Mariupol, and we will find out all of it when we liberate this land. And the only way to stop this atrocity, to stop this uh, uh, ra uh, rapes of uh, women in front of their children, rapes of children in front of their mothers, is to liberate our land and to kick out Russians from our land. That's the only way. No statements, no um, press releases, no calls to Putin cannot stop that. We can stop this on the battlefield, and that is the only way to uh, to stop uh, these atrocities. I call to member states to help us uh, with um, establishing this international tribunal. I'm also a member of Parliamentary Assembly of Council of Europe. We did uh, vote for the resolution in April session, uh, asking for members of Council of Europe to, do, to uh, have this uh, special international tribunal. I think OCE should do and can do uh, and have a strong voice uh, in this matter as well and can contribute to that to make sure that all war crimes will be punished because the real peace will come only just when justice uh, will be there, when uh, the victims will understand that their perpetrators are being punished. That's the only way to uh, uh, to, to to stop this. And uh, also, uh, I'm really sure that uh, we have uh, we need a courage uh, to uh, exclude or, 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 or um, um, for, for a time, I don't know the procedures, but we did that in Council of Europe. We, cons we excluded Russia at all from the membership. We need to find a way uh, in the rules 
to if there should be a procedure written, then this is the time to write this, to find this procedure, and to exclude Russia from members because, uh, of the OCE. Because in the name of our organization, two main words, security and cooperation. There is no cooperation with Russia and Belarus, and there is no security in Europe because of Russia. Thank you so much. Thank you. You may have seen also in the chat uh, a comment by the uh, Belarusian uh, parliamentarian who spoke, Mr. Um, uh, Savinik, uh, who says that the uh, statement had been misunderstood. So let's also see what is in the written text uh, text when you, when it's circulated. So um, we have now two former presidents of the Parliamentary Assembly. Oh, no, no, sorry. We have Dr. Hedy Fry uh, next. Uh, sorry, Dr. Fry, you have the floor. Thank you very much, Secretary General, President Sedefeld, um, and, uh, and Mr. Zonetti. I, I would like to start by saying, I don't want to give you the history of this war. I do not want to talk about what has, uh, what, what is going on. We've heard it. It is a, an illegal war of horror, of a condemnation of human rights. It is something that my prime minister in Canada and the Canadian parliament is calling very clearly genocide. This is what it is. We need to call it for what it is. It is time for this body of parliamentarians to take action, strong, fierce and aggressive action. We know there are rules, international rules of law that we must obey, but Russia has not obeyed them. And so we must remember that we cannot be like Russia and disobey the rules, but we must escalate all the things that we're doing. We must actually, in fact, escalate the sanctions. It is not good enough to take away um, the, the financial assets of oligarchs. We must seize them and put them towards helping Ukraine with regard to its financial humanitarian support and with regard to mass weapons. We must increase the number of weapons we're sending to Ukraine. Canada has been in Ukraine for seven years training Ukrainian forces to work. We have now sent 3,400 NATO forces to help with what is going on in Ukraine. We need to escalate the things we're doing. We need to cut Russia off and do not buy any of its oil, gas or energy. There are different ways of getting energy. Canada is looking at hydrogen energy, energy and moving oil to help Europe right now during a difficult time. We have to come together and escalate the things we do. We must close, Canada has closed its airspace and its ports to all Russian vessels and planes, private or not. Um, we must deal with the refugees that Poland and all of the other Baltic states is being inundated with. We must help with money to settle those refugees there, to make them live, and we must accept those refugees in our countries. We now have an Operation Ukraine travel that we do in Canada. Uh, the Air Canadian Airlines, Can Air Canada has given its air miles. People are con contributing air miles. We have now begun to send charter flights to Ukraine to bring Ukrainians here to Canada. And we are going to bring as many Ukrainians as we can in the shortest possible space of time. When we hear that women and children are being raped, when we hear that children are being raped in front of their parents, when we hear that children are being abducted, there is no longer any ability for us to say, oh, let's talk about some sort of agreement. Russia has shown clearly that it does not obey rules of law. It does not keep its promises. Uh, and we need to support right now, wherever we can, if Finland and Sweden agree, for them to join NATO. We need to support that. And then there's some positive things we need to do. My prime minister just went to Ukraine and he opened the Canadian embassy again in Kiev so that a Canadian flag will fly in Ukraine. We should make sure all our flags fly in Ukraine in, a, in solidarity with Ukraine. We have to increase what we're doing. It's not good enough. Canada walked out of the G20 stood up and walked out of the G20 in the United Nations when the Russian Federation began to speak. And we left and we need as OSCE EPA to actually suspend Russia and Belarus from the OSCE EPA. We cannot any longer play silly games. 
this is genocide, this is war. We need to stand up and be counted as parliamentarians. And I think this is a, the only message I have to give. And whatever we need to do, we must escalate. And so I am begging you all to take a stand. Let us not be nice and kind and listen. I actually turned off my image when the Belarusian um, uh, delegate was speaking. I would not sit here and listen to someone spout lies. I think we have to be strong. We are an organization of 57 nation states. Those of us who oppose this brutal, illegal, and ho horrible war must stand up we must do more and we must take real strong steps to, re to refuse to have a Belarusian stand up and speak in this forum, nor the Russian Federation stand up and speak in this forum. Thank you. This is war. Thank you, Dr. Dr. Fry. That was loud and clear. Um, we will conclude now with uh, uh, two interventions by former presidents who are also signatories of the call for action um, uh, uh, from, from a couple of years ago. And then we'll have a formal conclusion by uh, the uh, uh, current president, uh, Margarita Seder. So first, uh, we have uh, Adrian Severin. Well, thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Ambassador Zanier and dear colleagues. Uh, it is an uh, uh, honor for me to be with you today and to address this very hot issue. Uh, I certainly would remind everybody that politics uh, should be done, policy should be done with uh, hot hearts, and we have heard a lot of speeches coming from the heart, but also with cold minds. So let me uh, try to add uh, to this debate uh, something which perhaps was uh, is not going to repeat what has been said. I'm not uh, going to contradict, to be against of what has been said, but to add something from a slightly uh, complementary uh, perspective. Certainly we could easily agree that uh, Russians are all wrong and the Ukrainians are all right. But uh, even if we agree on that, this doesn't help very much. What is not about the power of the right, but about the power of the might. And uh, likewise, what does not have its source in international law, but it is a, is a source of international law through the peace it leads to. The solution to war cannot be sought in law, but law must be sought in the solution that ends the war. In this context, we certainly should ask ourselves before asking the others, do we want peace or do we want war? Surrender is not an alternative. Surrender, capitulation is not a solution. But if nobody surrenders, now one of the sides are going to surrender. That doesn't mean that war is the only solution. We have to find a different solution than surrender and or war. So uh, admitting that we want peace, the question is whether we have a military solution for peace or a political solution to end the war in Ukraine. For the OEC, I believe this is a false dilemma because our rationale, the ra uh, raison d'etre of the OECE is to find political solutions to crisis preventions and for crisis management. This is why this organization has been created. For war, there are other institutions, other organizations, other alliances. That is why we should only be concerned with the political solution. Personally, maybe I'm wrong, but I think that there is no other solution but the political solution. I would like perhaps that our friends are successful on the battlefield, but I have many doubts that this is realistic. The strengthening of Ukraine's armed resistance capacity or the strengthening of the armed power of Ukraine's uh, neighbors of the Eastern and uh, Eastern European countries, as well as a, a strengthening of the sanctions, economic sanctions, can only be used as a bargaining stick, as a bargaining chip, as a stick in the negotiation. Yes, we have to follow that way, but only bearing in mind our desire to find a peace solution and a political solution for peace. So far, anyhow, those uh, sticks didn't provide themselves to be very successful. On the contrary, I think 
we are suffering more uh, because of, of uh, the sanctions we had in mind rather than uh, Russia or uh, I don't know who else. And certainly I can only praise the United States for accepting cost of this uh, of the sanctions. But we should also bear in mind that not all our participant states are as strong economically, as strong military, as strong politically, as strong and coherent socially than the United States. So some others might find it more difficult to support these costs. Uh, so we were, we were, and we are going to consolidate the stick. Where is the carrot? The carrot is a compromise, and compromise means giving and taking. What we are, what are we ready to give? This is a major question in order to have peace. What are we ready to give to compensate Ukraine for the losses it will accept if they accept? in exchange for peace. It looks to be better, to my mind, to cover the cost of peace rather than to cover the cost of war. And uh, within this frame, we have to remember that when we have to negotiate, we have to negotiate with people whom we do not like. We have to negotiate with our enemies, with, with our opponents and not with our friends. Therefore, I think that the presence of Russia within the OEC is crucial in order to negotiate with the enemy, if I could call them enemy, anyhow, to, with our opponents. Without them, our organization is meaningless. We were formed in order to talk with the Soviet Union. And uh, well, I don't want to compare Soviet Union with today Russia. Anyhow, Soviet Union was by no means uh, an easier uh, partner of conversation than uh, Russia of today. Uh, I think uh, that uh, everything shows that the stakes of this war are much higher than some Ukrainian territories. This is why we cannot leave the Ukrainians alone to negotiate peace. Uh, we, I think that we have to consider a broader format for a multilateral agreement, for a multilateral, multilateral peace, uh, uh, peace, uh, peace agreement. And from that point of view, I think, and I suggest, uh, I think that it is appropriate, it would be appropriate to set up a small group of experts under the umbrella of the OECE to draw up a package deal suitable for a future peace treaty, which, as I said, will be not, should be not, could be not a bilateral Russian-Ukrainian treaty, but a multilateral one. When we have such a blueprint, we will be able to say more about the specific steps to be taken to reach peace. Of course, assuming we are really interested in peace, and I think that at least OECE is interesting interested in peace. Thank you so much. Thank you, thank you Adrian. Thank you for your uh, proposal. And, uh, those are being duly noted and we'll see whether uh, there is, uh, how can I say, support uh, uh, to move in the direction that you suggested. Um, next speaker is uh, George Seretelli, uh, also former OSCPA president, one of the fathers of the, if not the father of this uh, uh, initiative called for action. George. Thank you, dear Lamberto, uh, dear friends. Uh, I very much appreciate uh, this conversation as always. And uh, really frankly, thanking Lamberto for great leadership. And um, of course, very much pleased to see here uh, my Ukrainian colleagues, first of all, I'd like to greet them and Nikita, uh, I see here uh, Potoraev and also Artur Gerasimov, our good friends, and I wish them to endure all the troubles and uh, to see, you know, the bright future, which, of course, will be. Uh, uh, fully agree with some of my colleagues here. I'll try to be very short. Hey, the Fry outlined many things, which I fully agree. Uh, and uh, also previous speaker, Mr. Severin, uh, referred to, to peace agreement and referred to agreement, of course, that any war will end with agreement, we understand that. But the main precondition to start any negotiation is to 
have a ceasefire. And first of all, Russia should stop atrocities in Ukraine, should stop the flattering of Mariupol and the genocide in Mariupol and the bombing of Odessa and, and what they are doing there. So that's a first prerequisite for any negotiations, any peace talks. So that's the first thing. And what we see here, there's a no will for that. If you compare, for instance, the nine May events, I was watching uh, let's say uh, very shortly how the how the parade of nine of May was in Moscow. There was a dull, outdated, gray event, and in opposite in Strasbourg, European leaders discussed future of Europe. There was a very vivid distinction between these two worlds. And here, I think I'm very happy to see that uh, many leaders and and uh, um, Fry just recalled the very recent visit of Justin Trudeau, uh, Americans, and then the, the great uh, land lease law, which was adopted a few days ago, which could be a game changer in this process. Uh, and I was very proud to see my very good friend and colleague, Senator Cardin, next to President Biden. It, it reflected input of parliamentarians. And I'm very, again, very happy and proud that many of my colleagues are participating and adopting laws, uh, allocating money to the uh, Ukraine, uh, the military support of humanitarian support or accepting refugees like Poland, Germany and others, the United States, Canada and so on. So that's that's a need, uh, that's an action that we have to do. But beyond that, there are two things I'd like to very shortly mention. One thing is a Moscow mechanism, which was uh, very rightly mentioned, I think my Romanian colleague mentioned about that, Radu Mihail, and it's very right thing. So we have to use OSCE, have to use this Moscow mechanism. That's, I think it never used, uh, in a, what I can recall, never used effectively, but it's a very effective mechanism of assessment, of fact-finding, and especially with with a thought in mind, or with a plan in mind that people who are committing war crimes, they will be punished and that they should be accounted. So that's a Moscow mechanism, and I have to uh, encourage uh, many of my colleagues to support this process. And another uh, thing which we discussed many times, we discussed it when Russia invaded Georgia, we discussed it on the first war uh, with Ukraine, what to do with Russians, what to do with Russian delegation, what to do to prevent, I'm so regretful to hear what our Belarusian colleagues said. Uh, I know him, he's a quite a talented man and how he's squandering his abilities on this, on this absolutely, you know, the unnecessary and negative things. And uh, it's very difficult to sit, you know, and, uh, and discuss with the Russian delegations, uh, which the Russian delegation thinks how to, we can proceed in future. So we, in OAC and also in parliamentary assembly, we have to try to find ways how to bring these people uh, to justice and especially uh, when it comes to parliamentary relations, I understand that the main principle of this organization is a dialogue, and as the president always fostered that, uh, and always be, was tolerant to many things, but there are things which are intolerable. What happening in Ukraine, it's intolerable. To justify that, it's intolerable. So that's why we have to be very resolute. And if, if it's necessary to change rules, but countries or delegations should know that there is a price for deeds. So that's very clear. So I don't know what will be uh, a result of that exclusion to stop credentials or what, but we need something. We could not continue in that way in the parliamentary assembly. It will destroy all the organization fight. So thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Margareta, for your leadership and very good idea that delegation will go to Kiev, to go to Kiev, to express solidarity there, to be with our Ukrainian friends is very important now. Thank you, George. Before giving the floor back to uh, Margareta for her conclusions, I see that Hedy Fry would like to make a comment. I hope just a quick one, because we need to, to conclude. Hedy, here the floor. Yes, I know, and I'm sorry, I, I, uh, I, I, I will be quick. I think that we need to remember history. If we do not recall history, we're doomed to repeat it. I remember when we talked to, to an aggressor, 
uh, during before the Second World War, that Britain was very busy talking about appeasement, etc. We have been working since the Budapest Agreement, and we have been working uh, to help to talk to Russia to, since they entered Crimea. We have been sitting at tables, we've been talking. This country has decided to ignore all promises, all agreements. What it is doing at war crimes, it's horrific. Somewhere along the way, we, as, as George said, we need to be able to talk about peace and about all of those things after we have a ceasefire. After Russia has removed its aggression, we can no longer do the kinds of take the make the mistakes we made before the Second World War. I just need to say that. Thank you. And now back to uh, Margareta, President Sederfeld, uh, for concluding remarks. Uh, Margareta. Thank you, Ambassador Sanier. And thank you, dear colleagues, for all your remarks. I I found this debate very engaging, very important, and I hope you share my view. I would particular thanks our Ukrainian colleagues. Mikita Potoraev, Arto Gorasimov, Pavlo Frolov, and Yevgenia Kravchuk. Thank you for part your participation. It has meant a lot for us others. It has given a picture of the situation in Ukraine, which is very difficult for us who live in peace to understand. Thank you. And also thank you to all you co dear colleagues who have expressed your views, what you see as important for us to do as parliamentarians and members of OECPA. The suggestion that had been presented and also with the comments of uh, Secretary General Roberto Montella, we'll go directly to the uh, Committee on Rules of Procedures, and we will see what they say, what they suggest. But there is also, of course, possibilities to suggest something. I, I see it's, uh, in, I can see both perspective. It's important with responsibility for those who are aggressors against the member country. It's also important with the perspective of dialogue, but I do understand very, very well that it's not the time for dialogue. I need to be ceasefire and I need to be respect for Ukraine's territorium, for Ukraine's integrity, for Ukraine's international agreed order, and for the humanitarian perspective. That's important. And there was said here before, Yes, there have been signs of what's have gone on, but none of us have expected that it should be a full-scale war in a whole country. I say Transnistria, I say Georgia, I say the illegal annexation of Crimea, what's happened in Donetsk Luhansk. And what's important here as well, I think as a lesson, is not to be quiet, because what's have happened after all these four incidents I have said, is that it was an increased level of activities when it's happened. And then media was quiet, politician was quiet. Don't let this happen with the war in Ukraine. We need to continue our support for Ukraine and for peace for Ukraine and in Ukraine. And I think this have also today give us a lot of energy to continue our activities in our national parliament, to give support and pressure for unity, because it's the unity that make the sanctions work. It's a unity that also can help those people and countries who suffer from the sanctions. I think here about the starvation, for example. It's the solution is not to remove the sanctions. The sanctions have to be there because it makes Russian leadership suffer and make them accountable until there is the court of war crime, the court, uh, International Criminal Court of Justice, who can take over and make a, a court decision, a legal decision. And I think it's also that the, what's have been requested here, which we can't 
provide us with the EPA, but we as parliamentarians can bring it with us, is the need for, young, for Ukraine to defend themselves with ammunition, with weapons, but also the humanitarian aid. To listen to, to what's happened with rape, with schools that are bombed, hospitals that are bombed. It shows the need for, for example, for Red Cross activities, but also for us as parliamentarians to act. And I think this is an issue that we need to continue with. I do also see that a lot of us, we feel that we don't have the power to end the war. And that's true. But we could do whatever we can. And with this, we know that we are supporting Ukraine. And this is very, very important. We have a summer meeting very soon, in a few months. And there is still time for supplementary items, for amendments, to plan for side events. And of course, for us to continue our work and do everything we can and prepare to make strong statements that we can use back home in our national parliament and also send to the aggressors. And as I said, that there have been also today the dialogue, the discussion about the importance of dialogue. That's exactly why I have appointed special representative for parliamentary and diplomacy, uh, Vice President Reinhold Papka. And also, as said by awareness, that's why I plan to go together with the delegation to uh, Ukraine. I will not speak so much in advance, more afterwards. I see that as a very important step that we as parliamentarians also show solidarity in our activity. And I, I think the, the the discussion today have been very good and important, but it shows also that we need to continue this dialogue. And I really look forward because I hope that I can be in other meeting. I'm looking at the ambassadors a year in approximately one month. I think that's a good way uh, to continue our dialogue. Hopefully it's peace, it's ceasefire. Then the dialogue have to focus on how to rebuild Ukraine. If it's not, we need to continue our dialogue, what we can do. And when I say dialogue, it's a dialogue inside OECPA because we as parliamentarians need to have our discussion, our unity, and also get new input for what to do and how to do. And uh, I would like to send my best wishes to our Ukrainian colleagues once again from all of us here and the best wish for peace and security in your country. And we stand with you and we'll continue to do so until it's peace. And it's a peace that you accept and not what others think the chef, this peace should include. Thank you, everybody, for taking part today. I look forward to see you again. Thank you very much. And thank you, Ambassador Sangier. Thanks, thanks to you, uh, Madam President. I've taken note of your suggestion. I agree with you uh, that in a month's time, I hope uh, that the nature of the meeting will be a, difficult, a different one, and we'll be talking about uh, uh, the peaceful solutions and, and not under the pressure of an ongoing war. Um, from our part, we will uh, uh, circulate, first of all, as soon as we get it from uh, the Belarusian delegation, we will circulate the translation uh, of the uh, intervention uh, by Mr. Savink. Uh, I uh, apologize again for the technical problems with the interpretation. Uh, we will also try, but we would have to wait for that too, uh, to circulate as we did in the past, the highlights from, uh, uh, from the discussion, uh, just to have a record uh, of this uh, uh, important, uh, uh, important debate that took place today. So once again, thanks to all of you for uh, uh, your engagement in this discussion, and I uh, look forward to staying in touch until the next steps. Have a nice evening or a nice afternoon, depending on where you are. Thank you.